Good afternoon, all, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Market Matters. My name's James Gerrish. I'm the uh, author of Market Matters, uh, portfolio manager at Market Matters, and I'm also a portfolio manager at Shore and Partners. So uh, thanks for joining us today. Great to have so many members on the line. We've got a lot to get through in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So uh, we're going to crack on and do it. Today's uh, webinar is going to be all about uh, stocks. It's going to be about uh, portfolio positioning around our domestic portfolio. So the flagship growth portfolio, the income portfolio and the emerging companies portfolio. We're going to run through some stocks that we have in those portfolios and our thoughts around that or stocks that we've recently uh, sold out of those portfolios. Um, we've got a number of new stocks to talk about and we've got a bunch of questions that you've sent in uh, ahead of time. So I'm going to cover all of those uh, things. So I hope you get some benefit out of um, today's, uh, today's uh, uh, webinar. In terms of just a quick disclaimer before we get on to it, a, a reminder that all advice today is general in nature and doesn't take into consideration uh, your personal circumstances as general information only. And also uh, look at the, uh, we're gonna chat about some performance metrics. So keep in mind any projections, uh, the past performance I should say is not indicative of future performance. Just before I begin, I just wanna give a, a very um, a very quick overview of um, sort of market matters and, and what we are and what we've been working on over the last couple of years and where we're gonna take the business uh, in the coming couple of years. So um, obviously we're about providing actionable and professional opinion. We wanna be your source of truth. We wanna provide you with eyes on the ground in the market. We wanna be timely in our, uh, in our communications to you and we wanna be diverse in our communications to you. We wanna be forthright and transparent in everything that we do. And over the last couple of years, we've been working hard in terms of both the website, but also in terms of the team that we've been assembling to deliver that for you. So uh, as I said before, I am uh, uh, wear a couple of hats. I'm also a portfolio major at Shore and Partners. And within that agreement or within that um, dual scope, we have access to Shore's uh, analysts. Uh, so there's a dozen or so analysts here at Shore, which I lean on pretty regularly. Uh, Shore's also got a, 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 a agreement in place with UBS Research. So we can lean on the UBS depth of their analysts. Uh, so we often uh, speak to UBS analysts. Uh, and in our own research effort, I've recently, we've recently put on a lead research, a research lead at Market Matters to coordinate our research efforts. And um, no doubt you'll be introduced um, uh, to him over the next uh, couple of months or so. Um, and this is all in aid of underpinning the resources that we draw on, the depth of resource that we draw on to bring you the content in the Market Matters reports on the website, et cetera, uh, on a daily basis. We're also going a step further this year and we're um, looking to expand the depth of fundamental coverage on our site. So stay tuned for some really interesting developments over that in the coming couple of months. But there's my short spiel on Market Matters, where we've been, where we're uh, going. Um, again, thanks for joining us. So I'm going to kick straight off into um, looking at uh, our large cap portfolio. So I'm just going to um, uh, start sharing here. So just to give you an idea about the large cap, that this is the, the, the flagship growth portfolio, the Market Matters flagship growth portfolio. It's a actively managed top 200 focused, um, we call it a growth portfolio, but that's really to describe our view around it being a total uh, return portfolio. That's in, you know, we, 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 we look at returns in a total return concept, meaning capital growth um, plus income. To give you some ideas around, uh, we'll give you some insight around performance. It's up 3% or a bit over this financial year to date. The market's slightly lower. Um, on a one year view, it's up 10.5%, um, a few, about 3% above the market. And on a two year view, it's around 20% per annum, which is about 7% per annum above the market. In terms of um, the positions that we have, it's a fairly concentrated portfolio. And I'm going to focus, um, so it's around 20 positions. And one position that we sold yesterday was Whitehaven Coal. And I've had a bunch of questions about that um, after we put that alert out. So I thought I'd cover that on the front foot straight away. So Whitehaven Coal is on the, 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 the screen in front of you, which you should all um, be able uh, to see in terms of um, at the screen in front of you. Obviously, coal producer, we've had it for a, a while. It's been good to us. We took profits yesterday. And there's been a lot of questions around why we took profits when our views around resources um, are positive in the in, in the medium to longer term, and also the outlook for Whitehaven's earnings are pretty strong. 
I think one of the things that um, we often write about in the market is about risk versus reward. And that is basically about understanding what can go wrong versus what can go right in the market. And overlaying that, and this is a really important concept, it's about what is already known knowns in the market and what's perhaps not known in the market. Right now in the coal markets, you've got a coal price that has been um, incredibly, uh, incredibly strong. Um, so you've had, um, I'm just going to uh, bring you a chart of the April uh, futures contract in coal to give you some examples, give you some understanding of how strong that coal price has been. Um, we've put this in reports a few times. That's not sustainable. And a lot of these commodity prices uh, that have rallied really strongly, crude oil and the like, are not sustainable at current levels. And we think in the very short term, they're overheated. So that's the first thing. Why that price spiked very um, aggressively has been more around um, an issue that Peabody, which is a US coal company, um, has had um, hedging their expo or their production using derivatives. So effectively, they're short derivatives and they've had to scramble to cover those, and that's what pushed the price higher. So if we go back to Whitehaven Coal and think about what's in the, what is known knowns, so and we know the coal price is high, we know they're going to have a very strong second half in terms of um, earnings. We know that they've started paying dividends, uh, which are going to increase over time. And we know that they've got a $400 million buyback facility that has just been um, uh, in play. We know the trend's up. and We actually like the space. The energy transition that uh, we often write about is this concept that uh, the world is moving to renewables, and rightly so. But it's based on the, the, the energy transition will take time. And there's a lack of new investment going into these more traditional energy sources like coal and that's been um, supportive of the miners of those um, those more traditional energy sources um, like coal but what happens if um, Whitehaven coal have some issues in terms of production because of the rain in the Hunter Valley uh, that could stifle um, their production outlook in the short term what if coal prices come back and they probably will given the um, the, the dynamics of the market that I just spoke about so you know we took a really good profit in Whitehaven coal it's not to say that we won't go and re-enter that um, we think over time the stock is probably worth more but in the very short term Coal prices got elevated. This became a very, you know, the, the market became a long Whitehaven coal. So in my mind, it's prudent to take some off the table and then revisit at a, a later date. Another stock that um, has been under a fair amount of pressure is Aristocrat Leisure that we hold in that portfolio. So ALL, so uh, we hold it in, the, um, uh, in the, uh, the flagship growth portfolio. We bought it at higher levels. We're down about 10% on the position. Uh, what do we think of it now? So they obviously have poker machines, but they're also big in the gaming. So mobile gaming um, and, and a lot of the games, they develop a lot of games that, um, you know, um, millennials and the like, I'm not a big gamer, uh, but I understand it's very, very popular um, these days. They had some exposure in the Ukraine. They had a, 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 a team of about a thousand over in Ukraine that they're relocating and that is not going to have any material impact on their, uh, on their uh, financial results this year. If I look at Aristocrat, it's come back to trading on 21 times. It's got revenue growth um, of about 16% over that's expected for FY22, and that's dropping down to 20% earnings growth. So this is a stock that was just near on 50. It's now down around $36. It's on 21 times, and it's going to grow their earnings at 20% um, this year. That, to me, is a really solid um, a, a position to go out there and um, buy. We've got it in the portfolio. If we didn't have it, we'd be buying it um, now. In terms of um, zero is our largest um, holding in this portfolio. So this portfolio, uh, we've got about a 7% weighting in zero. This is uh, online accountancy, et cetera. This is a really expensive stock. So there's no two ways about it. We um, we uh, have held this for quite a while. We're slightly up on the position. Obviously, we're not up as much as we were when the stock was trading at $156 per share. A couple of things I'd, I'd highlight here. I said it's really expensive. So this is trading on about 16 times revenue, so uh, which is incredibly expensive. It's not making money. But if I look three years out, this is going to be an incredibly profitable platform. And that's when they're going to, uh, I guess, turn the dial and cash that, um, cash the, you know, be able to monetize their really strong and sticky user base. So um, that stickiness in their user base 
uh, is really key. So zero, we like down here around the hundred dollar mark. We've added to it recently, uh, and we're 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 bullish on that stock. I'll throw another one in here too as well. Um, CSR that caught my eye this morning. Um, obviously, building materials. Uh, we hold it in the um, uh, flagship growth portfolio. Um, really, you know, it's it's trading around five eighty. It can see, you know, if I'm I'm looking in the short term, I can easily see this popping to six dollars fifty in a short amount of time. So that would be another one that I'd have high conviction on uh, in, the, uh, in the very short term. Moving on to our um, uh, income portfolio. The income portfolio is a little bit different in terms of the way it's structured. So the income portfolio is primarily large cap Australian shares, but also uh, income securities. So hybrids, um, uh, li other listed income, uh, securities um, that hold commercial loans. We've got a bond fund in there, et cetera. So at the moment we're split 70% in equities, 30% in income securities. This portfolio has done um, particularly well over the last um, couple of years and more so around the volatility that it shows. So the portfolio captures um, as, as captured more than the market upside, but also with significantly less volatility than the market. To give you some stats around performance on that portfolio, um, in the last 12 months, it's up uh, around 12%. And in the, on a two year view, it's around, up around 18% um, uh, per annum over the past two years. It's got a cash plus four benchmark. And as I said, it, um, it holds equities as well as uh, income securities. It's got more of a skew towards the value um, uh, side of the equity space. Uh, and of course, dividends are really important, but also the the, the, the um, consistency and the growth in those dividends. So this is a portfolio that yields about 4.8% um, and it's about 80% franked as well. One stock in this portfolio, and I've had a bunch of questions from it from this, um, for this um, webinar, is Magellan. Um, we know it's been under pressure for all the reasons that have been very highly documented, but today I'm just going to set out um, sort of the... The bigger picture view of, you know, on Magellan and what we're thinking about it, I, we wrote about it in the morning report today saying for aggressive traders, um, it's a buy here. Um, we uh, highlighted where we place stops and where we place a profit target. I'm going to give you a bit more of an um, uh, investor's perspective on it um, now. So Magellan, it's obviously been hurt. It's dropped from um, sort of $70 down to 15 a huge amount of pain. Magellan's now trading on 7.6 times FY22 earnings. So the, the consensus earnings for FY22. When it was trading at its peak, it was trading at 30 times. So obviously we've had a, um, a huge re-rate from the market. Fund managers are all about um, a, a priced on confidence, if you like, and priced on performance. Magellan's had poor performance and that's eroded the confidence in the stock. But my view now would be that it's overshot to the downside. And the more likely scenario is that it's going to rally from here. At the peak of Magellan, they had funds under management of $118 billion. Obviously, they've done a great job growing that, um, but that has come back from um, back in recent times. Right now, they've got about $77 billion worth of funds under management. That, that is, so they've got um, their market cap. Their market capitalization is $2.8 billion. So they've got about 28 times the farm versus market cap um, for Magellan. If you think of Platinum, Platinum uh, is market, has a market cap of $1.3 billion and they manage uh, about $21 billion worth of FUM. Uh, they're obviously cheap. There's been a big um, decline in these, the multiples that the market's prepared to pay for active um, asset managers. Um, but they're on, their, 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 their FUM to market cap is on a multiple of 16. Magellan's on a multiple of 28. So clearly Magellan is priced for significantly more outflows to take place over the coming months. And we're probably likely to see that, but the stock is already pricing that. The other interesting aspect that uh, we had a question on is around the option issuance um, that was recently announced. So what Magellan are gonna do is going to offer or give shareholders one uh, option with a strike price of $35 with an expiry in five years time for every eight shares that you own. So you get a free option. Um, the uh, for, 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 for backing and staying with Magellan uh, and, uh, and they will have value uh, if the stock price is above $35 in five years time. Why that is important, it's not around the, um, it's not around the, um, 
it's not around the, the the view they've taken on shareholders. I know they've they've brought shareholders in for the ride, which I think is positive. It's around the deal that they've put, which is similar uh, in nature for their staff. So their staff are uh, uh, being provided options, saying stick with us, um, back us to turn this, or, or work hard to turn this round, and you'll be rewarded financially. I think that's the key. So not so much what they've delivered the shareholders, but what they've delivered the staff to retain them, because a people business, it's a confidence business, and Magellan need to go out there and uh, obviously uh, improve the confidence that the market has in them and if they can do that successfully they won't be trading on eight times earnings they'll be trading on you know 15 times earnings it won't take much for them to um, turn that dial if they get it right and that's the important thing it starts with performance it starts with it starts with performance so improving performance then it ends with maintaining that consistency of performance and building out their um, building out the market's view of the Magellan team not just one front man. One of the other stocks, and I'll talk very shortly, is about when we come to the emerging companies portfolio is Pinnacle, which is one I've written about, and I'll talk to that um, very shortly. So Magellan's the first one. We're not, we have a small 3% position in the income portfolio. It's hurt us, we're down over 50% on it. So that means now it's a portfolio weight around one and a half percent. So it's not hurting the portfolio a huge amount, but it's annoying to be there. Do I think the stock will go up in time? I do. And over, you know, and, and we're going to pick our time to, to average that position in the uh, income portfolio. So we haven't lost complete faith. There was a question that I'll get to just now, just around, is Magellan like a zip? They're completely two different business models. They're completely two different risk profiles. And I'll touch on zip and tell you how, why it's um, a lot different to Magellan when we get into the emerging companies portfolio, because we still unfortunately own that stock with a small weighting in the emerging companies portfolio. The other, the other couple of stocks for the, um, for the income portfolio that um, I particularly um, want to talk about now. The first one was GEM, which is our, which is G8 Education. This is our last um, portfolio edition uh, for the income portfolio. Uh, this is a really uh, interesting turnaround story. It's cheap. It's obviously involved in childcare. Childcare has been a really difficult um, uh, sector to be in over the last two years. It's very similar to aged care, and aged care is actually a sector I think we should be spending some time looking at as well. Um, um, uh, G8 Education is all about um, uh, occupancy levels. So improving the occupancy levels they have across their facilities. Um, they have improved the balance sheet over the last um, uh, year or so. They raised uh, equity um, and now they have got their business in the, the, the right possible um, uh, point to now grow it. So we bought that and it's now dropped 9% since we bought it. It has gone ex-dividend um, today. Nothing has really changed in that. So we've got a 3% holding. It's not huge, um, but I think that's one that is, is a really good inexpensive turnaround story that will do well over the, uh, over the next 12 to 18 months is their story gains traction and the turnaround becomes more well-known by the market. And that's sort of the, the, the type of stocks that we like to look out for in this emerging, in this, uh, in this income portfolio that has, as I said, has done particularly well over the last couple of um, years. AGL Energy has been uh, getting a lot of airtime. We obviously bought that in the fives. It's now up around seven. Um, Cannon Brooks, Brookfield, uh, lobbed a bid at $7.50. They then increased that to $8.25. AGL is not engaging. I was slightly disappointed that the board didn't engage with that offer at $8.25 and, and simply rejected it. Um, I do think there is more underlying value in that operation than $8.25 implies, but from a selfish standpoint, we probably would have been sellers at $8.25, um, given where we bought that position but for now i'm not a seller at 724 and i'm more on the buy side i think the value of their assets um, is as uncomfortable and curly as their coal generation assets are um, uh, there is deeper value there than um, what is being implied by the share price in terms of the uh, emerging companies portfolio i'm just going to get onto that very quickly we've got um uh, this has been a, a struggle in the last 12 months or so so to give you an idea around performance in the last three months the portfolio is down 15 percent not great um in the last 12 months it's down six percent versus small odds which is up five percent if i go and look at a two-year view uh, the portfolio has increased by 20 percent per annum over the last two years and versus small odds um, which are uh, up 13 percent per annum. So overall, the portfolio has been um, uh, performing well on a longer term view, poorly on a shorter term view. 
but a couple of stocks that I would stick with. And I think that's an important point. Expect a lot more volatility in the emerging company space than you would in um, the, um, the income uh, portfolio. So if you put the income portfolio on one spectrum around consistency and reliability of returns and the emerging companies portfolio on the other, the flagship growth portfolio is somewhere in between. So we're trying to deliver a suite of portfolios that are relevant for um, uh, different risk uh, profiles of our, um, of our subscribers. In terms of the, um, in terms of the stocks that I'd like to highlight right now, ABB, which is Aussie Broadband, um, is uh, the, the largest holding in the um, emerging companies portfolio. Um, Coronado Coal was until that was sold out of the portfolio yesterday. This is a really good growth story. So it's a really interesting telco, really strong management. Um, I think there's there's a little bit of key man risk in the um, from the from the CEO there that I'd point out. But other than that, this is a really interesting business. Origin Energy yesterday outlined that they want to grow their broadband customer base to 600,000 by FY26. Origin Energy uses a white label version of Aussie Broadband. Um, I use Aussie Broadband. They're a, great, they're a great company to deal with. They sort of remind me of UE in the insurance space where um, they're delivering better customer experience than um, the majors. So that has got really strong growth um, uh, and, uh, and a business that we're going to continue to hold in the emerging companies portfolio. And we'd be happy buyers um, of that stock here. Dubber, which has been a very highly uncomfortable position in the emerging companies portfolio, unprofitable tech has been hurt, hurt really hard. So if I'm thinking about Dubber at $1.26, there was a large line of stock that went through after market yesterday. Um, that to me is a really strong sign of a low in, in, in a um, you know, capitulation of a seller. Um, so Dubber would be one that I'd, um, they, they do really interesting voice recording and um, artificial intelligence um, over that voice recording. Um, they've, they're ingrained in the large telcos. They've got some really interesting partnerships and Dubber would be one that, um, you know, really speculative. Uh, but really interesting at current levels. Um, we think it's worth more than three dollars. It's now trading at a dollar twenty-six. Um, Calix in the emerging companies portfolio is a really interesting um, environmental solutions. Um, CXL environmental solutions um, business. They've got this calcification technology that um, basically is, is used for industrial applications like um, create, um, uh, manufacturing cement and the like. So that is one that if you uh, want, a, want a bet on um, uh, um, a company that's doing great things from an environmental perspective, that's got real commercial applications, um, Calix is one that we particularly like. Uh, we've got it in the emerging companies portfolio and we very much like that stock. Um, Pinnacle is the last one that I just want to cover in terms of um, um, stocks that we like now for the emerging companies portfolio. This is um, a fund manager that has um, pulled right back around $10. We've owned it before. Um, they have stakes in a bunch of other fund managers. They're not backing one person to shoot the lights out, nor are they backing one asset class to shoot the lights out. So um, this is one we're likely to put in the emerging companies portfolio very soon. And that pretty much wraps up the, um, uh, the, uh, the presentation around our portfolios. I'm going to get on the questions. And I think these are are really interesting. And I, I know we've got about seven minutes to go on the allocated time, but I will stay on a little bit longer if we need to. The first question is around um, Bubba and JD.com. So Bubba, Alibaba in the, in the US, um, you know, big e-commerce platform um, that's been absolutely trolleyed. We have it in our uh, international equities portfolio. And JD was the other question. And this is asked from Alex, basically saying, are we still keen on these two stocks and does it represent good value. Charlie Munger uh, has gone out there and been spruiking Alibaba. They've been averaging into it. I'm going to give you some stats around Alibaba. So right now, they are on a EV to, um, uh, to revenue multiple of 1.3 times. So EV is um, enterprise value. So enterprise value looks at um, the market cap, um, adds on the debt, and minus a, minus a cash. So it's a, it's a better representation of sort of the true, the size of the business, if you like. So they're on a multiple of 1.3 times. At the peak, so when they were trading around 300 bucks, they were on about seven times EV um, to EBITDA, sorry, EV to revenue multiple. That's 
that's very high, but right now it's very low. On a more traditional learnings multiple, they're on 11.4 times. So um, this is a business that's about 45% cheap versus historical norms. I can see why Charlie Munger is going out there and buying it. They've got um, earnings growth of 13% over the next three years. So to me, this is a really strong buy in Alibaba. Um, we got a, um, and JD is, is very similar. Um, they're growing, um, they're growing quicker but they're not making the money. They're reinvesting and grow. So they're growing top line at about 20%. Um, they're doing revenue. So JD, just to give you a, like to set the scene a little bit, JD is doing, um, they do revenue of 150 billion next year. So these are, these are huge businesses, right? So if you think about what I was saying about um, zero before it being expensive, it's trading on about 16 times revenue versus an e-commerce business trading on about 1.3, 1.5 times revenue. The revenue, why, why zero trades such a big multiple is the customer base is a lot stickier um, than a um, someone that goes onto an e-commerce platform and makes a purchase one off. When you're ingrained in a business like zero, when you've got all your accounts on a business, when you're paying a monthly subscription, those customers are a lot stickier than a one-off transaction on an e-commerce website. We got a stock and we've still got in the emerging portfolio uh, very wrong and it was Adore Beauty. Um, Adore Beauty uh, trades on um, when, when um, they listed, it listed on three and a half times uh, revenue, it's now back to about 1.2 times revenue. So if I look right across the e-commerce complex, whether the whole debate about pricing something on revenue is another thing to, to happen, happen and that, that would go on forever, um, but they've all come back very, a, a very long way. They're proper businesses, they're businesses that are earning uh, that, that are making earnings uh, and they've got good futures. So I think now is the time. JD is, is one I'd be um, certainly happy to buy here. Bubba is the other one I'd be certainly happy to buy here. Um, uh, there's a question here from about our um, sale in Oz Minerals um, uh, from uh, Bernie and should he be selling um, Northern Star and uh, WGX with gold trading above 2,000 a ton. So Northern Star, so, so I'm not particularly bearish on gold. We've got, or, or bullish on gold. So gold is trading, as you may mention, I would trade up through 200. It's now come back a little bit. I think you need to have gold in your portfolio given the conditions, you know, given the backdrop um, from a geopolitical standpoint. Um, I'm not, we've trimmed our gold position in the strength. We'll be buyers again into weakness. Commodities are cyclical. So I think that's you know, a, a key point and we're, one that we've um, stressed this week by our actions. Commodities are cyclical. They move up aggressively and down aggressively. Um, so our view is that we're in a commodity super cycle. Commodities over time will rally and we want to be exposed to them, but we're going to be more active around our allocations in the short term. We're going to be sellers of strength and buyers of weakness. I spoke, um, and Bernie's just thrown in here another question about MFG. Will they do a, a, an on-market buyback? I'm not sure about the buyback, Bernie. I think if I was Magellan, I'd, I'd, I'd be keeping cash um, for um, safety rather than buying back stock at this current point in time. Um, there's a question here on Zip, um, whether or not it is um, has any sort of heartbeat. So um, th this is a good question because it... Um, it's obviously they're raising capital. They're doing it at dollar ninety. They placed uh, about one hundred and forty million bucks at a dollar ninety to institutions. We didn't go into that capital raising. Um, the they are going to um, you know shareholders will have the ability to buy a two percent discount to the five day VWAP. So is this a proper business? So the way they make money, what's important for Zip is obviously they've got to acquire. They've got to get on merchant platforms. They've got to acquire customers. They've got to um, uh, lend money to customers and they've got to source money on the other side. That, uh, and then they've got to um, uh, manage the risk of those, the credit risk of those customers. So right now the sourcing of the money's um, okay, but to grow, you've got to continually source money. The, um, the risk that they take on when they lend money to customers was really well understood in Australia. They've gone and grown pretty heavily in the US and that hasn't been as well understood. So the, um, uh, the, the Yanks are not as good as paying back 
their buy now pay later debts as the Aussies. Uh, and that's what's caused some grief to zip. They'll change their risk metrics, but that risk metric, that change to risk metrics has an impact on top line growth. So for now, look, it's been a it's been a disaster in the last little while. Um, we've still got a small position in the emerging companies portfolio to keep it on our radar. Again, it's another one that it, it, I think it does have. It's not a dead duck. It's got an interesting future if it can get its metrics right. And what I want to see is an improvement in the bad debt profile that they announced um, uh, at their last update. Uh, in terms of questions, so what the, that was there was another question on Zip. We've got a question on um, Wiser. So Wiser is a consumer finance business that uh, we used to hold. Um, we sold around um, 26, 25, 25, 26 cents from memory. Um, I don't have I don't have huge concerns about Wiser. We don't cover it from a research perspective anymore, um, and I haven't looked at it in a while. My concern ar around Wiser was that the competition in the consumer lending space. So, what they do, they go out, they create a good platform, they go out there and market that platform, they get consumers on board, they lend them money at the outset, they go and source money from whoever's going to give it to them, uh, like a challenger financial. You can go and get challenger lend out money at exorbitant rates. Um, as time goes on and um, the, you know, the runs on the board they get, they can source cheaper funding. They can ultimately securitize their own, um, own loans and, and, and source funding a lot cheaper than they can from the outset. And that's what they've done. And that's the, that's the bull case for, for, for why Wiser will be a success in the long term. If they can continue to grow the um, number of loans they're writing and then source, continue to source funds at cheaper and cheaper rates because they're managing those loans very well and the market's got confidence in them, they will um, create a, you know, a really strong business. The issue for me is the competitive landscape. So um, I've, never, I've, I've seen a huge number of um, new entrants into this space and that's putting pressure on the rates they can achieve uh, and obviously the acquisition of customers. So I don't, I don't really have a huge view on Wiser. I don't think it'll be, uh, yeah, I don't really have a huge um, uh, desire to go out there and buy Wiser because of the competitive landscape, but I don't think it's in, you know, it's still continuing to grow the top line last time I looked. Um, uh, just a question here on commodities. Do I, um, you know, if the correction is short and sharp, could one miss that buying? So this is from Debbie. Um, overall, Debbie, I would be, you know, you, you've got to be buyers of excessive, uh, sellers of excessive um, um, strength in commodities. So um, rather than going out there and um, selling weakness, I'd be a seller of strength in commodities. We'll be a buyer again of weakness in commodities. We like the medium term prospect in the commodity space. Um, you know, if you look at, um, yeah, uh, yeah. If, if you look at a lot of um, commodities out there, like BHP is our major proxy, right? So we haven't sold BHP. We've kept large positions in BHP. We still like it, but up at these levels, we're more of a seller than a buyer than BHP. We sold Santos probably a little bit too early. It popped above eight dollars, um, but would be, you know, but um, our preference in that in the in the energy space is Woodside. We're going to get some Woodside shares in our bet from uh, through BHP. Um, would we be a buyer at these levels? No, because crude oil and coal and nickel and all of those things, the world doesn't work at prices they're trading at now. So um, they revert. There's no cure for high prices than high prices themselves. And these will revert. So I think the important takeaway from all of this is that you've got to remain active in the commodity, um, uh, in the commodity space. Um, in terms of um, uh, questions, we've got... Um, my daughter, my 20 year old daughter has just started investing and I appreciate the incredible geopolitical and local complexities. What should she be doing? Um, yeah, how should she go about it? So Mac, this is a really interesting question. I think that the, the first thing is about teaching, um, teaching or, or encouraging them to think like an investor. So looking at the big wide world out there and thinking as an investor, and I had an interesting um, um, aspect or, or a thing with my own daughter recently. My oldest daughter is 10. Um, she um, bought some shares for the first time. I actually lost a bet and part of the bet was um, she got to choose what shares uh, she would buy. Um, uh, she got 500 bucks that, um, uh, and you know, she goes up to YGA near our place and she buys lollies occasionally and she likes that. And I've got her to think about 
um, you know, I, IGA as a business and, and how the ownership structure works and now she follows it, she owns some shares in it and then her to look at the, 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 the bigger picture, you know, brands that she's interacting with or places that she's going that she really loves and then dig into the financials that underpin those companies. And that's, you know, uh, um, the first and, and biggest thing that I would say is think like an investor. Because once you're an investor, as most people on the call would know, um, you know, you think like one over time and just that, you know, that longevity of thinking like an investor throws up so many interesting observations and uh, investment ideas. JRV is a, um, Gervois is a question um, uh, from, I can't see actually who it's from, uh, but this is a stock we actually cover from a research perspective through Shore. Our analyst, Andrew Hines, loves it um, in, in cobalt. Cobalt's obviously used in, um, you know, in uh, lithium-ion batteries. They've got a really good management team, as you may mention. Also, we like it. It's a little bit speculative for, 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 for us, for our, you know, our large portfolio. It's capped, I think, at about a billion dollars. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, yeah, we like it and they're doing a really good, credible job in the, in the space. There was a question on um, Syrah Resources as well, um, SYR. Um, I actually like Javoir better than uh, SYR at this point in time. Virgin uh, UK is a stock um, from a question from Jeff. Is this an opportunity to increase our exposure? Yeah, I think it, we, we, we took that opportunity, Jeff, this week. Um, we've increased our weighting into Virgin uh, money. Um, you think about what's playing out in Europe and uh, obviously in Ukraine and Russia is uh, very, you know, very disheartening and, and really upsetting. Um, a lot of these European exposed stocks have been kicked to the curb as a consequence of that. Virgin is exceptionally cheap on a, a global context. UK based banks are cheaper than Australian banks because of the, the, the competitive landscape over there. But still, it's cheap and it's got this digitization strategy that I really like. So Virgin below, you know, around this three dollars, we bought it recent. We've we've added to it recently. We've now got a reasonably large position in Virgin UK or Virgin Money, I should say, in our flagship growth portfolio. Moving on to other um, questions, we have. Um, um, I'm I'm currently holding Woodside shares. This is. Um, I'm currently holding Woodside shares at 43.32 per share, although the price has gone higher recently. It's still in lost territory. What should I do effectively? I think the first thing I'd say is forget the price that you paid for something. It's worth what it is today. Um, I, I, I constantly, um, it's, a, it's a battle to, to forget the entry price, but you really need to be investing for today and what the likely future is going to be. So, you know, we sold uh, Santos this week. You could use that as a proxy um, and we will, we, we will, we will re-enter at lower levels if it, if it, um, if it goes down there, not Santos, but we'll be buying Woodside. We think that's a, a better exposure to the oil and gas thematic over the next two to um, you know, one to two years, Santos has got some challenges following the acquisition of Oil Search and the, the, the capital they require to develop some of their assets. Um, JLG, um, a, a question here from Kel um, is thanks for your work, you guys, absolute rock stars. Thoughts on JLG considering all the insurance related work that will be coming up? So, um, uh, uh, JLG are uh, non-residential um, uh, construction company. They do a bunch of other things. Um, the, the MD, um, Scott, um, I forget his last name, owns about 20% of the stock. They've done, they're, they're not cheap. They trade on about 40 times, so they're not cheap, but they will have a really strong pipeline of work going forward. So it's a, you know, he's got skin in the game. He runs it like a um, more of a private um, enterprise that really um, is, is is a good business. So I guess the key takeaway, yes, you're right. There will be more work for it. It's expensive, but it's been run really well. And you can see the trend on the chart is pretty exceptional. So it's hard to say anything but positive things about JLG. Um, I've got a, um, what is your consensus on gold and by extension, the big Aussie gold miners new, yeah, in the near term. So I think gold will probably cool here in the near term. So um, we took, we reduced our gold exposure through um, Northern Star recently. Uh, and Newcrest, you can see there that it's found a bit of resistance above $27. So we're going to continue to hold Newcrest. We're not going to sell it here. Um, but I think in the short term, the gold stocks 
will track lower. So we'd be buying, you know, if we we're buying or adding to Newcrest, we'd be doing it sub $25. So just, you know, the key point is around being active in these exposures, selling these, selling the, the, the strength that we see playing out there. Um, there's about five questions or so here. Why did PNL price drop so much? Is it, and is it likely to perform better? That's a really good point. So, um, the PI share price dropped because a lot of fund managers were dropping. So PI invests in fund managers. When you've got Magellan trading, as I said before, on eight times earnings, you've got um, Platinum trading on a similar multiple, Perpetual, Janice Henderson, et cetera. Um, PI was trading on sort of 30 times earnings. So if you've got, you know, they own a bunch of unlisted fund managers. When the listed fund managers fall away and the, the, the valuations decline, then only naturally you would imply a lower multiple for the unlisted managers. So P&I is a, a really good business. As I said, we will likely put it into our merging companies portfolio very shortly. Craig's asking about a price target um, in terms of Woolies. I can see Woolies trading back up to the top of its top of its range. I know that it's been uh, obviously under pressure from supply chain issues, but if we can get $40 out of Woolworths um, and pick up a div dividend on the way, we would be, um, yeah, we'd be um, mad not to do so. Uh, in terms of, um, where are the other questions? So why are we still holding um, South 32? Um, we don't hold South 32, unfortunately, which we did. Um, you raise the possibility of tesserant in any update or thoughts. Um, I, we only wrote that about, Harry wrote that. Harry manages our uh, emerging companies portfolio. Um, the the um, emerging companies portfolio has, you know, tesserant, I think about a $200 million market cap. It's probably a little bit small for that portfolio. Um, so yeah, it, it, interesting stock. I've, I remember listing it many, like, I think 15 years ago, um, I looked at, at listing the company I was working for was listing Tesserant. Anyway, it, 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 I haven't looked at it a lot since. Um, he quite likes it, but there hasn't been. We're waiting until they can get some traction on the board, but the market cap of 200 is probably a little bit low for us. Michael asks, what is your preferred sector exposure? Would you prefer VUC or Macquarie? Depends your view, right? So Macquarie is a really good long-term um position that will continue to do well over time. But um, you know, Virgin UK probably has more upside in the short term. So it's right at the bottom of the range. The way we'll play Virgin is buying at sub $3 and selling it around $4. That's our view around Virgin. Um, I see Shaw are very positive on Max 7. Would you consider, yeah. So I, I have looked at Max 7 or Harry has. Um, and um, so that is a possibility, yes. And are you happy with capital health? Uh, yes, it's been pretty muted in terms of share price. If you look at, uh, this is a diagnostics business. Um, if you look at the valuation of that business relative to um, you know, competitors out there and what private equity have paid in the space, I think capital health still screens very cheaply. Um, so yeah, do you have a specific consensus on silver? No, I don't really have a consensus on silver. Um, Gillian's asking any comment on the Simic takeover. Well, Hock Teeth, you know, they own, I think it's 80, 82% of the stock. So it's going to go ahead. There's no other, no one else will come to the party and take out Simic um, because they've obviously got that large blocking stake. Um, and then with um, some more questions on gold, which we covered. I'm going to wrap it up there. I've gone slightly over it. To, it's 12 past one. Um, the bulk of you have stayed on there. So thanks very much for, um, for, uh, for, for staying um, on the call. I hope you found um, this to be useful. I have, um, I have um, you know, we, we, we are gonna continue to do more webinars on different um, topics. Um, probably 45 minutes is probably the, the, the most um, realistic time frame. So once again, thanks for your insight. We're, we're working hard at Market Matters. We're pleased with uh, how the portfolio is progressing. Um, we've obviously got our two international portfolios that we didn't get a chance to speak about. Keep asking questions through the Q&A function on the website. And if you've got any, uh, any feedback around what we're doing, what we can do better, whether we're doing it great, that would be fantastic. I always, always like getting positive feedback as well. So from all the team at Market Matters, thanks to all our members. Have a wonderful day and, uh, and speak to you soon. Bye for now.